Oh, may the words of my mouth and the meditation of all our hearts be acceptable and pleasing in thy sight, O God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. Well, please be seated. Good morning. It's good to see you all. Uh, thank you for making it. The uh, Oakland Marathon is going on today, and I've been here two and a half years, and it's the first time that I've been the priest and the Oakland Marathon has actually happened. So I didn't realize that uh, people needed a heads up, so I apologize for the inconvenience. And next year we'll let people know and we'll get the word out so you can be warned. But uh, anyway, thank you for being here and dealing with that inconvenience. So this weekend has been great for me because I love college basketball. And for those of you who like sports and like college basketball, it's the NCAA tournament. And things are going well, uh, and it's, it's exciting to watch, and we're having a good time. But one thing I enjoy watching is how do the coaches motivate the players? Because the coaches, well, kind of like all of us in life, the coaches want their players to do this. And he wants them to avoid this, right? I want you to play this way. And I want you to avoid making mistakes and playing poorly. And so how do different coaches encourage this positive behavior and strategy? And how do they discourage mistakes in this other type of behavior? And uh, watching and from my own experience, I know that some coaches use kind of negative reinforcement. And they like to yell and scream and call their players all kinds of awful names. And it's like, well, if you do well, I won't call you awful names. But if you do poorly, I'm going to treat you poorly. Right? And uh, I was an athlete, and I always responded to coaches that were more positive. Instead of saying, man, you're an idiot. Why did you do this? Why can't you focus? Instead of saying that, I enjoyed coaches that were like, you're so talented. You're so capable. Uh, thank you. You can do this, Jim. You got this. Good job, I believe in you. Like, I responded to that positive reinforcement a lot better than that negative reinforcement. And uh, a few years back, I was visiting my brother and his family, and my nephew was 10 years old, and they're living in Texas. And my nephew, as 10 years old, wanted to play football. And in Texas, football is kind of a religion. Like, I think they like Jesus, but they really, really worship football, right? <laughs> And so my nephew, as a 10-year-old, they would have two-hour practices four nights a week. And this is just a lot. And he kind of was telling me his season had ended, and we went for a walk. And he was telling me, like, uh, man, I don't know if I want to do this next year. And I was pointing out there's different types of coaches, and some yell and scream and call you an idiot. Some do this and that. And... Uh, I said, I said, you know, maybe a different sport would have a more encouraging coach. And we kind of had this back and forth, and I presented this idea, and he said, yeah, next year, I think I'm going to play soccer. And I said, oh, yeah, soccer coaches seem to be a little more of the encouraging type and all that. And my nephew, being the brilliant person that he was and able to do math, he said, yeah, but either way, soccer's just one hour a week at night practice. <laughs> He's like, so even if the coach is yelling, it doesn't take that long. You know, I'm not around him that often. And so it just made me laugh. But watching basketball, it's exciting and everything, but it's also like, how do you encourage this behavior and discourage that? One of the more difficult ways of doing that, or one of the, I think, a negative way or a, a base way is through fines. So like in a library, you want uh, people to turn in the book on time, and if they don't turn the book in on time, you find them. So it's kind of, this is the way of encouraging positive behavior and discouraging negative behavior. Now, in today's gospel reading, we have Jesus telling this story where the first half, Jesus is saying, repent. And you could kind of read it as like a little stern and ominous. Like, you need to repent. Repent, repent, repent. And it's like, all right, like, stop doing bad behavior and repent. And then, but then right after that, you have this story of the fig tree that won't bear fruit. Right? And the fig tree won't bear fruit. 
And so the owner of the fig tree in the garden wants to like cut it down and get rid of it. You're worthless fig tree, you're taking up land, and you need to get out. And instead, Jesus, uh, or not Jesus, but the gardener says to the owner of the land, he says, uh, he says, just give it one more year. Let me tend to this tree. Let me get, get it, fertilize it, water it, and all that stuff. And let me, let me take care of this tree. Let me give it some grace and some kindness and some love. And maybe that will uh, bring it to bear fruit this time. Right? And so, uh, <clears throat> so you have this like two things from Jesus where he's saying like repent. Kind of like avoid this negative behavior. But then at the same time we get this parable of grace and kindness and love. And so I think it's beautiful in Lent, as we're all exploring and looking at our own behavior, our own habits and practices, and what we're doing. And it's good to know, like, hey, let's strive for excellence. Let's try to avoid our wayward behavior. And let's notice that there's this patient gardener tending to us that loves us and cares for us and wants what's best for us. Right? And so you have these two things in hand where it's like, I want to be good. I want to avoid being wayward. And uh, when I do, God is there with love and kindness and grace. And in Paul's letter to the Romans, we didn't read it today, but in Paul's letter to the Romans, he has this great passage where he says, I want to do good, but the very thing I want to do, I don't do. And the very thing I hate doing and I don't want to do, that's the thing that I do. Oh, wretched man that I am, why can't I do right and avoid being wayward, right? This is Paul's dilemma 2,000 years ago, and I feel like we still uh, deal with that today. And uh, so we want to hang on to these things in tension of wanting to do good, wanting to pursue God, wanting to do our best, wanting to avoid being wayward, wanting to avoid... Uh, slipping up and we have this beautiful picture of God like hugging us and loving us and saying uh, just waiting for us whenever we're wayward when we come back God's like yeah it's okay you're here and I got you and one of the practical ways we can do this comes from a shame researcher Brene Brown she's a New York Times best-selling author and she did a lot of work on shame and vulnerability. And in fact, when she was going to write her book on shame, all of her own shame started to come up. And all of her own issues started to come up. And she uh, was feeling all this shame as she's like becoming an expert on shame. And so writing the book, she shared vulnerably those issues that she was dealing with and talked about being vulnerable and open with your struggles and your shame is a great way to combat shame. But one of the things how she defined shame would be, say you do something you shouldn't do. Shame would say, I would respond to that and say, I am an idiot. I did something wrong, right? You have those voices in your head, you're like, oh, I'm stupid. I, didn't, I did this wrong thing. She'd say, that's shame. And a more accurate way of phrasing it is, I did something stupid. I did something idiotic. I'm not an idiot, but I did do something idiotic. And it's a slight sort of semantic difference, but what, it's, what it signals is that ontologically I am Jim, beautiful, loved child of God. And you are as well, gifted, beautiful, loved by God, and... You and I make mistakes and we're wayward. And so this has also come out lately. And instead of saying, oh, so-and-so has, is, we, instead of saying so-and-so is schizophrenic, we now say so-and-so has schizophrenia or someone struggles with schizophrenia. And it seems like this minor difference, but it's a massive difference to me because it's saying that person ontologically is beautiful and is loved by God. And they deserve all the grace and kindness, and they struggle with schizophrenia. When you label someone as, that person is schizophrenic, it's almost like, well, 
They're not ontologically as loved by God as we are. They're beyond whatever. They do this, they do that. You know, all of that. Whereas if you say they struggle with this, then they're still ontologically like you and me, loved, beautiful, chosen, gifted, and capable of receiving our love. So it's like this minor difference, but you can see it in the way you talk to yourself. When you make a mistake, when you do something wrong, you can say, oh, I'm so stupid. And it's like, no, 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 I'm not. I did something stupid, but I am loved by God. And so in this Lenten season, as we are trying to explore our practices, and maybe you chose to do this uh, thing during Lent, and sometimes you've uh, maybe not been as good at it. Or you're trying your best to do this and occasionally you're wayward. Just know that when we turn to God, God is there like a patient gardener tending to us and waiting for us to just come back. And with a smile and like a big hug, God is like, that's okay. I still love you. You are still beloved, beautiful, and amazing. And you're not an idiot. You're not stupid. You're not this, that, or the other thing. You're a beautiful child of God. So we hold these things in tension, right? Jesus comes in and says, repent. And it's like, that's right. I want to do better. I need to do better. And at the same time, when I'm not, when I'm wayward, when I make a mistake, the grace, the kindness, the love of God is there, always waiting. To give me a hug and be like, Jim, you're loved. It's okay. Amen. Amen. Amen.